So please, let's welcome Bill Jones to our room. He's going to talk to us today about his experiences with refugees. Yeah. <clears throat> well, thanks so much, uh, Susan, for inviting me to join with your class today. It's great to be here. Uh, it's good to be in where it's warm today. We've had uh, quite a few days of cool weather. And I'll be talking as we go through the uh, next 20 minutes or so, talking about um, my experiences of working with folks who have found themselves in a place where they need shelter. Uh, I'd love to look at some of your projects. Susan shared with me the form that you're filling out, projects you're working on for displaced persons. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about that, and, uh, and hopefully you're coming up with some great ideas. Um, there's a lot of formers in the uh, introduction she gave to you, former director of refugee resettlement, former director of uh, faith-based lobby office in Washington, D.C. I wanted to put those on there because they're key to my presentation today because they are the places where I had a lot of the experiences that I'll be sharing with you. Uh, I put together a very, very basic uh, PowerPoint. It's mainly just so you can see the pictures of some of the things that I'll be talking about. Uh, and I've labeled this in search of a home. Because if you're a displaced person, that means that you have nowhere to go. At least that's my understanding of it. And in my mind, when you're a displaced person, you have no safe, secure, warm housing. And I'll be talking about that on a number of different perspectives. Uh, the picture here is a family of a Syrian, uh, a Syrian family who uh, are refugees and they've had to leave their home. Just to, I, I won't bore you or give you a lot of facts and figures, but I just wanted to, to let you know that uh, you know, resettlement of refugees is a huge thing. Uh, these are facts from uh, back in 2014. The 2015 figures from the United Nations where these come from uh, have not been tabulated. But uh, you know, there were, uh, as we look at this, the three top countries where refugees are being forced in, uh, from their homes and becoming displaced are in Turkey, Malaysia, and Lebanon. Those are the three main hubs of where refugees come to, to put in their application to be resettled. Where they are actually leaving are uh, Syria, which you might, uh, if you've kept up with the news at all in recent months, Syria has the uh, uh, largest uh, population of people leaving. And then Dominican Republic of Congo second, and Myanmar or Burma is the third. Those are the three largest populations are having to be resettled. And where are they going? They're coming to the United States, to Canada, and to Australia. Perhaps more important for me uh, are, the, is, are the figures in the little graph down here. And I'm going to put on my glasses so I can read them. But this graph points out the, the reasons people are having to leave. They're either being legally and physically, uh, their life is at danger. 35% uh, of the refugees today, they're having to leave probably because of political uh, oppression and things. 21% uh, are survivors of violence or torture. 13% uh, are women or girls at risk. That's a large population of, of, of refugees. When you're talking about 13% of the total, they're women or girls at risk. And why, anybody want to take a guess why they may be? Let's think southern Sudan. What's going on in southern Sudan? There's a civil war, war going on. It, there are tribes clashing against each other. There are uh, political factions fighting for the oil. And so villages... Uh, armies or militia, they're not really organized armies so much, they're coming in and persecuting the people and who are at largest risk in that? The women and children, the, lots of rape, lots of uh, uh, indentured servants and that kind of thing. And so that's why this statistic is, is so large. And, uh, and then 26 percent are folks who have no foreseeable alternative durable solution for housing. In other words, their, their homes or villages have been burned, uh, their homes have been bombed, and they have no other really solution other than living, leaving their country and going somewhere else as a displaced person, as a refugee. 
This is just a picture, and I wanted to show you some of these pictures. This is a Palestinian refugee camp that I visited back in 2004. And what do you see when you look at this picture? This is, this is on the West Bank, actually close to Bethlehem. But what, what, what is your first, what, do you, what first impression do you see of this, of this area? Yes. Very cluttered and clamped. These thousands of people are being forced to live in this very, there's just never enough room for refugees or displaced persons. They've left a large country. They've left their population. They've left where they live, and they're being forced to live in another country in a very small area. So what did they do? And as, as I was thinking about you, know, you engineering students, when I was there, they were telling us that these concrete buildings just go up, just go up. There are no building permits. There are no, there are no designs, whatever you guys have to look at to make a proper building. It's none of that. It's just weak, and it's weak concrete. And, and so these buildings just go up. And then they very soon start to crumble or they become hazard for the, for the people that are living in them. They're just not adequate. But it's the only solution they have. They, <coughs> concrete is cheap. It's the way they build the, their structures. <coughs> Never enough space. These, the, this was back in uh, 2004. Uh, the, the one I showed you before was back in 2004. Uh, now we're looking 10 years later, and either these... The previous buildings had been destroyed because of war, bombs, or other things, or they had crumbled and fallen apart. And so now they just start over again. This looks a little better. There's a little more room in between the buildings, but I can guarantee you in another two, three, four years, there'll be another building here, there'll be a building here, there'll be a building here. Never enough space. And again, they're using the, sa the same uh, subpar structure. Let's move to Sudan. I was in Sudan in 2005, uh, and I want to show, show you something here uh, that's, uh, I'll point out different things, but the Civil War began just after 2000 in Sudan, and, and so the, the refugees had to flee mostly the southern part of Sudan and went to the northern part. Uh, when you go from one part of your country to the other part of the country, what, what are you considered there? Has anybody heard? the term of internally displaced persons. You know, you're talking about displaced persons going from, from one place maybe to another country. But you can be internally displaced. You can just have to be, you have to be moved from your safe environment to another place that you feel a little safer. This is in Darfur, Sudan. Uh, I visited there, and uh, these structures, if you look at them, they're tents. And these white tents and blue tents, Mostly are provided by the United Nations Commission on uh, High Commission on Refugee Resettlement, UNHCR. But uh, they provide these tents, and people make the best of them. They, you can't see it too clearly, but these are straw huts that were built in 2000, and they just went up quickly. They put them together best they can, threw the tent over top, and that's where they lived for almost 10 years. It evolved from 2005 to 2014. Now you think these are, should be temporarily displaced persons, but they're not. They left and it's not safe to go back. The Civil War continues, and so they, they have to make the best they can of it. And so now the tarps have, have weathered and worn away and everything, and they've begun to make adobe houses. They've replaced the straw with, with mud brick, with mud uh, block. and. Uh, they're living in the same place. Their living conditions have improved only slightly. Uh, this was the uh, uh, United Nations uh, Commission on Refugee Resettlement came in. They went into Chad because now we're talking about they've left their country. They're no, lonely, no longer internally displaced but they moved uh, across into Chad, and uh, United Nations have, have you know, got these upgraded tents, these better tents. Uh, they're, they're, they're still tents. They're still people that have been displaced in their home area, and now they have to live uh, as best they can. And again, just as I said with uh, Palestinian refugees, it, there's never enough room, because, you know, Chad 
is being gracious, and they're saying you can come and stay in our country, but we're not going to give you all of our land, so we're going to give you a little block here, a little block there, and you have to put up your tents. These folks uh, will be there for a while. We've talked about Syria. Syria, this is, this is a refugee camp that was set, set up last, uh, last summer uh, in Turkey. Turkey is one of the nations who takes in the most refugees of any other. Uh, their, uh, their borders are fairly open. They're receptive uh, to new folks coming in, and uh, they try to, to do the best they can to receive uh, refugees. And, uh, and again, you have everybody lives in the same kind of little white tent. Uh, they try to live as normal a life as they can. If we look back at the Sudanese pictures, uh, you could see women carrying water to, from the wells and different things. Here, they have a larger tent where the men have come to, uh, to worship. Uh, it's their temporary mosque, if you will. I now want to shift. Uh, I've, I've worked with a lot of populations. I work overseas with, with refugees. I work local, locally with refugees. Um, I want to talk about maybe another population that's not necessarily always considered as displaced persons, but they certainly are. Uh, and I raise this question, are there inter internally displaced persons in the USA? Can you think of anyone that might be considered that? And maybe I'm stretching the definition a little bit, but it works for me. Yes? Absolutely. Well, you, you all remember New Orleans, what happened down there, Katrina came through, and, and people were dispersed all across the United States, weren't they? It wasn't safe to go back. Their homes were destroyed, their, and, and a lot of those people have not returned and will not return. What about another population? Any others? Yes, back there. Absolutely, homeless. The folks who have lost their homes because of a housing crisis or economic uh, crisis or, or many different reasons lead to homelessness. Uh, this is just a picture of a rescue mission in Lebanon. It's a place where those who are displaced have lost their home for whatever reason uh, may find shelter at a place like this. Uh, again, uh, just a few statistics about the homeless population. Um, over the course of a year in the United States, two to three and a half million people will either be on the streets or find themselves in an emergency shelter. Over five million low-income households have serious housing problems due to high housing costs, substandard housing conditions, or both. Within two to four years of existing foster care, 25% of foster children experience homelessness. About 600,000 families and 1.35 million children experience homelessness in the U.S. each year. And about 50% of the total homeless population it's part of a family, and it's estimated that between 25 and 40 percent of homeless adults are veterans. What, and we could talk. I could. I. I really. I really could talk about a lot of this for a long time. But what, does anything jump out of you there that surprises you or that uh, bothers you? <coughs> Let's take the last one. There, 25 to 23 to 40 percent are veterans. Why do you think veterans are homeless? There's no real easy answer. Yes? Well, like they go off to war or something like that, come home to nothing, like the life or something left them around there, like you know, with nothing, or like disabled. <coughs> you touched on a couple there. Uh, they left and went to war, their family unit fell apart, uh, dad was gone too long, mom looked around. I mean, it happens. Uh, they went over, they came back, their body was damaged physically, uh, they weren't able to work, they had no other family support, they became homeless. They went overseas, they came back, they were damaged mentally. One of the largest contributions to homelessness in the United States is mental illness and uh, PTSD, other things like that. So there are a lot of issues around homelessness. Uh, there's an organization here, and let me go back here a minute. The last sentence there, how about State College? Is there homelessness in State College? I hear a lot of heads shaking. Have you ever met someone downtown that seemed to be homeless? 
How do you identify somebody that's homeless? Those are some pretty big questions, aren't there? There certainly are homeless in State College. Uh, Susan mentioned earlier, right across the street is Hearts for Homeless, which is a, a day shelter for the homeless of our community. They can go in and stay warm, get lunch. Uh, they can work on uh, job resumes. They can uh, search for jobs online and things like that. It's, I've worked with the homeless population here in town for about three years. Uh, and um, if, if I had to today, I could, I could sit down and identify with you about 70 people here in town who are homeless in one way or another. That means they're living, maybe sleeping on a couch with Uncle Joe or, or Aunt Joanne. Uh, they are hanging out uh, at some of the 24-hour restaurants most of the day. Uh, there are about 70. Uh, there are, in town, I could identify seven what I call street homeless. These are guys that, that, but due to mental illness or addiction issues, they just cannot be around people. You know, we have an emergency shelter out of the cold, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But, but these seven guys, homelessness has become their way of life. They just cannot be in uh, a shelter with other people and those kind of things. Uh, out of the cold. Out of the cold is the emergency shelter that has been uh, formed here in State College. There are 13 faith-based groups, uh, congregations, uh, located throughout our community. And this is the shelter for our homeless. They come into a church basement and they sleep on a cot. They come in at 9 o'clock at night. They sleep. They get, get a little something to eat. They sleep during the night, and then they get up and leave at 7 o'clock in the morning because the church has to go about their normal business the next day. In this basement here, there's a, uh, a Montessori school that occurs during the day, so the guys have to clean out. Uh, and it's not only guys. There are women also. But uh, and it's emergency shelter. But that is their displaced person shelter. They have nowhere else to go. So they come to a church basement and do the best they can. Uh, we have, we average from 15 to 20 people who sleep in our church basements here in town every night from October through May. That is their housing. There are some creative ideas going on about how to address homelessness in, uh, in, in, in the United States. Uh, this is one that you look at it and say, well, that's really cute. Uh, and it is. Those are pretty, I like the colors, uh, little houses on wheels. You know, this is just an upgraded card box, cord cardboard box, you guys. But it is an upgrade. There's an organization called Jetson Green out in Oakland, California. Uh, he's the guy that started this with, was an uh, artist, uh, actually. And uh, he got to think and said, what can I do? Uh, you know, I see when I go out downtown in Oakland, I see homeless folks everywhere. And so he decided to start figuring uh, and uh, designing, engineering, if you will, uh, these tiny homes. They're made out of recycled whatever he can find. Uh, none of that uh, is, is new stuff that was purchased. They're recycled uh, uh, dumpsters and whatever else he can come together with. And it's growing. Um, uh, he, had, he made one uh, prototype, I think you would call it, and uh, had it sitting behind his house. And a woman just happened to come by and, and wanted to know if, if uh, he could. Uh, she met him on the street and said, can you give me $20 so I can do something? And he said, well, you know what? what, what uh, and he, he talked with her more and found out she, was, she and her husband were homeless. And he said, well, I'll give you this. And so instead of a $20 bill, he gave this family a home, uh, a home for, for this displaced person on the streets of Oakland, California. Uh, it's, uh, there, are, there are other movements to, to build tiny homes uh, for the homeless. This is a... a Something that was started out in Seattle, Washington. A group came together and said, "Well, let's see what we can do to build." Uh, you know, you know. If you heard of the tiny home kind of thing that's growing, yeah, I see some heads shaking. Uh, you know, and I live in a big old house, and sometimes I wish I lived in a smaller house. It'd certainly uh, be easier. Uh, I, I have mixed feelings about tiny homes for a homeless. Certainly, number one is the number one answer to homelessness is to get a person in a sheltered environment. Because if you're out on a street, uh, you know, not be able to eat, not be able to sleep well all night, you're not going to be able to get your life in order. So the very first thing that our homeless need is a shelter. 
And so if this is all we can do, then let's do it and get them in a shelter so they can begin to progress. But when I look at this, what, and especially when I think about state college, when I look at this and I see these houses in a row, what does this remind you of? What is this? In my mind, I see a new 2016 trailer court. I mean, that's, it's, am, I, am I off base there? It's similar. You've got all these little places. <coughs> now, what has happened here in Center County and State College with our trailer courts? They've been pushed away. They've been destroyed uh, so we could build more apartments, more student housing, more, uh, more housing uh, that meets the larger population of this community. <coughs> I just don't know how a tiny home movement would work here in State College. Where would you put it? Who is going to let you start putting these buildings on their property? That's a struggle, a challenge for those who are displaced. There is one group that is working at that, though. Uh, the New Leaf Initiative is an organization here in town that has their office on the top floor of the borough building over here. And they started a grow fund. And I know all you guys have heard of grow funds, uh, where you try to raise money for a, for a worthy endeavor. They, started, they figured out that uh, they wanted to build a prototype of a of a tiny home. And they estimated it would cost 20, almost $23,000. And so they started Grow Fund to see if they could raise the funds to, uh, to build a prototype and to get interest. I think here it says, they intend to sell the home at retail price. All proceeds will go to a project called Housing Lab, where a committee will be established to manage those funds and plan next steps for highest impact. And so what they're doing is they're trying to reach out to the public here in Center County and say, what is an answer? How can we answer this? Give us a little bit of funding. We'll build a home. We'll talk more and, and see what can develop. Uh, sadly to say, the, the, the growth fund did not raise the money they needed, but I'm sure they'll be exploring other options to do that. Uh, any questions so far? I've thrown a lot at you. I'm, I'm trying to cover, in my experience, the displaced persons that I have known. Yes? Is locating a place to put that account? Absolutely. I, I can't, I, I don't know where it would go. I mean, as I said, the, the places where we've had trailer courts have been pushed aside so we could build apartments. Uh, you know, it would, it, would, it would take some real creative thinking to come up with something like that. Because the homes, you can build tiny homes, but, but if you put them out in Belfont, where are the jobs? They need to be right down here close to the service jobs where they can work, where they don't have to have transportation issues to get here into town. Any of you live in, in Belfont, you know how tough it is to ride a bus in uh, on a regular schedule for an 8 o'clock job or to, that kind of thing. There are challenges in Center County for our displaced persons. This is one answer. Have you seen this beautiful building up on South Atherton? being constructed now. It's not finished. This is uh, a unit that will be used solely for affordable housing. This community struggles with affordable housing. It's, I, I haven't talked too much about my work of, of resettling refugees here in State College because we had to close the office after two years. We had committed with, uh, with the State Department to settle at least 25 families a year. It, it, it was impossible to find 25 affordable apartments and 25, or if mom and dad both work, and maybe even an older son, 50 to 75 jobs for these people coming into State College. So we had to close the office because we couldn't maintain what we were asked to do by the U.S. State Department. The U.S. State Department oversees refugee resettlement in the U.S. But there is a push to, to do affordable housing. Anyone who builds a new housing complex for instance, I think something's going in down here where, uh, where Hooters used to be or whatever, the Irish bar down there now. Uh, there's, a, there's an apartment complex going to be going up down there. It's huge. It'll be mainly for student housing. But uh, the borough contracts with these contractors that they have to build, for instance, if they build 400 units for students, they have to build a certain percentage affordable housing. Um, and so instead of building the affordable housing in with the 400 units downtown here, this contractor decided to go out on South Atherton, which gets a little bit out of town. It puts the affordable housing people all in one place, and, uh, and, it, and they meet their quota 
that's required by, by Center County and State College Borough. So there are ways to address, uh, address affordable housing, but there just needs to be so much more of it. And as I said in Palestine, as I said in Sudan, um, there's never enough room. Uh, we had to go over to South Atherton. We couldn't build it down here. We have to go to Belfont to build affordable housing because it's not, it's just, you know, right here in State College, we want our businesses, we want our university, we want our housing to, to have, to be the priority. That's, that's the way it is. Any other questions? Well, I'll close with this slide because it's, it's one of the ones that is, is most close to me currently. I am the director of this, of this small home in State College. Uh, it's a personal care home. It's a place where folks who have no other place to go. And these are displaced seniors. They have no family that can support them. They have no finances, maybe just a little bit of a social security check. And they have some type of debilitating illness where they can't live on their own. And so the House of Care is a place where these individuals can come and have safe, secure, warm housing. Um, there's, more, there's a growing need for this. Uh, if you're familiar with uh, uh, demographics of our nation, uh, we have more and more seniors. B us baby, baby boomers are getting old now. And, uh, and this is going to be an ongoing population. Thankfully, we have places like the House of Care that can uh, take folks like this in and give them the support they need. Well, that's about all I have to share. I uh, appreciate the opportunity. <laughs>